I always enjoy a story that's good for both a laugh and a cry. Of course, I don't mean a literal tear. I just mean the absurdity is so insane that it takes a laugh to process it because otherwise it's just too depressing. And in this case, that comedy tragedy combo is even more interesting to me because it packages together two things I love. Laughing at California degeneracy, an indulgence I can never resist, the undead horse to forever beat, plus actually very serious matters of principle to ponder. One thing I personally find difficult to navigate philosophically is what are often called victimless crimes and how to handle them as a matter of law. Think drug use or gambling, or in this case, prostitution. If consenting adults agree to a transaction, then nobody's rights are directly violated, strictly speaking. That's how I viewed these things as a matter of legal principle. It's not to say these things are moral behaviors, of course, or that we should encourage them, or that we shouldn't frown upon them and advise against them, or even shame them culturally. We should. It's just that on pure principle, I don't believe government exists to police the morality of your treatment of self. Government exists to secure the rights of others. On that basis, if you're not violating the rights of others, government should generally leave you alone. The counter-argument is that even if there's no direct victim, society in general is victimized when we tolerate such behaviors. Drug use doesn't just harm the individual, for example. It also harms the rest of us who have to navigate streets full of deranged addicts if we don't get some level of control. And for me, I've long considered that argument too abstract, involving a hypothetical victim in an indirect way. I'm very wary of intrusive government. If we start policing crimes based on what could or might happen, rather than what did. Well, enter this story to challenge my predispositions and demonstrate very convincingly that often, there is no could or might about it. That even if, in its purest form, prostitution involves no victim, it does carry baggage that victimizes society, and not just in a pearl-clutchy, won't-somebody-please-think-of-the-children kind of way, but with serious crimes committed against specific people, too. But also, actually, won't-somebody-please-think-of-the-children. Because clearly, somebody needs to. It's a perfectly California headline. Bay Area local ABC7 video showing alleged sex workers soliciting outside East Oakland school sparks call for action. And the report brings the goods, not just a video, but many different instances captured over only a few days. Prostitutes patrolling for work opportunities right outside St. Anthony's Catholic grade school in Oakland, and parents having to navigate around or even getting completely obstructed by scantily clad whores. The start of Catholic Schools Week, where a mom was walking across the street with her daughter as two women walked behind her. One appeared to be soliciting right in front of the school gate. Could I talk to you for a second? No, I'm fine, thank you. I was just curious what, what you're doing out here. What? I was just curious what, what you're doing out here. Uh, ma'am, I'm picking up a bag of chips and smoking right there. No further walk. What were you talking to that gentleman about? My chips. Now, in fairness, she does look like a woman who treats her potato chip acquisition very seriously, so perhaps that's partly true. Or... Maybe she's a prostitute paid in potato chips. It looks like that could also be the case. Either way, it reminds me of that recent story out of Seattle where that boisterous woman Ladonna was confronted for shouting racial remarks at an Asian woman at the gas station. Go eat your dog with some rice, bitch! That's what I said. It's not against the law, ho, fuck you! It reminded me because it's the correct diagnosis. It's not against the law. Nothing about this provocative patrolling as seen is a legal issue in California anymore, anyway. Now, it is true that to some extent, this prostitution problem has been ongoing for a little while now. It's not entirely explained by the recent legal change. Road construction in this area of Oakland pushed the local prostitutes into more residential areas, including by this school. It was a major issue through which mayoral candidates campaigned for votes in the fall. Every day, families are greeted with girls stopping traffic and soliciting customers. The Oakland is not a dumping ground people. Yeah, Oakland is not the place that you come to you don't do anywhere else. Yeah, Oakland is not the place for taking a public dump. That's San Francisco, right across the bay. Oakland is where you go to get shot, or 
to shoot somebody, if you prefer. So the prostitution problem existed prior, but it is worsening now because of a new law in effect to facilitate it starting January 1st. Recall the state senator from San Francisco, the aptly named Scott Weiner, famous for his prior hits like decriminalizing intentional AIDS transmission, making California a sanctuary state for child gender transitions, faking a hate voicemail by transcribing it on his phone instead of just releasing the recording and more. Well, now he has a new feather in his cap or perhaps a new button on his gay pride vest, Senate Bill 357, which decriminalized loitering related to possible prostitution. In simple terms, police used to be able to intervene if they saw someone just lingering around the sidewalk offering her nips for chips like that young lady earlier. Prostitution itself remains illegal, as does overt solicitation, but no longer can police cite a woman or even force her to move along if the only basis to do so is that she looks obviously hoary. Hilariously, Scott Weiner didn't write this bill to protect the rights of the prostitutes, at least not purely. He wrote this bill because he says transgender people were getting wrongfully picked up on account of their overtly hoary costuming. In part because he found it to be disproportionately targeting trans women. Because what it did is it allowed police officers to arrest a person, uh, not based on what they did. You don't have to do anything to get arrested for this crime, but based solely on how a person looks. So an officer could arrest someone because they were wearing tight clothing, high heels, and extra lipstick. So we're sacrificing our kids to protect transgenderism, but of course, it wouldn't be the first time. In fact, it's perfectly on brand for California and for Scott Weiner personally. He has made California a sanctuary for that ritual, and is proudly recruiting from out of state. And so now the new standard is police can't intervene on mere suspicion of solicitation. They have to prove it beforehand. If they don't see it directly, they can't take action. And so police in both Oakland and San Francisco say that despite constant calls from the community to deal with the problem by this new law, their hands are tied. If you ask the Oakland Police Department, a new law is making it harder for them to crack down. With the passage of the loitering bill, their hands are sometimes, um, they're, they're somewhat handcuffed. Unfortunately, uh, there have been some recent legislation that has been passed by our state senator, uh, which has now made loitering for the purpose of prostitution no longer uh, a criminal offense, so our hands have been tied. Scott Weiner says the police are wrong, and when confronted with video of what's happening outside the Oakland school, he identified other causes for which he says the police could intervene. So what would you tell police who say that their hands are tied? They're, first of all, the police's hands are not tied. Uh, they can arrest people for soliciting. They can cite vehicles that are stopped in the middle of the street. They can arrest Johns. They can arrest pimps. That car could be cited right there. You can't stop a car in the middle of the street. If they think they have, if they have cause to think that solicitation is happening, they can arrest for solicitation. But even if he can point to other causes for intervention, the fact remains his law removes a cause for intervention. If you're just standing around looking slutty, you can't be cited or directed to move along. And maybe you think, as I actually am inclined to, yeah, well, you can't really criminalize standing around looking slutty anyway. As objectionable as it may be, the dangers of an overly intrusive government are greater. The proper response to degeneracy is not an authoritarian state power grab. But as this story demonstrates, at least shades of it might be. Of course, I'm not saying we should scoop these women from the streets and put them on the trains to the camps. I am saying there is some merit to the idea that either you intervene when this stuff is minor or the consequences you suffer later are major. Because in both Oakland and San Francisco, the proliferation of prostitution has proliferated other crimes as well. More gang association means more gang violence. He says the ongoing solicitation and trafficking has resulted in more shootings between pimps and gang members. It's created neighborhood burglary. She says an environment of crime led to them getting burglarized recently. We lock ourselves in my son's closet uh, and call the police. When I tried to understand what had happened and looked at the cameras of that night, there were people having sex on the stairs. It's not that it's the 
prostitutes that are breaking into houses. It's that it's the environment that this creates. Perhaps she's mistaken, though. Maybe that John was just rummaging for a bag of chips with which to pay for the sidewalk services, or maybe not. These San Francisco neighbors speaking with ABC7 say they are effectively held hostage within their own homes. These residents say they're trapped inside their homes until something changes. It's like every night pimps and prostitutes come and take our street hostage and neighbors are shut in. But even if you want to argue these crimes are tangential, not directly related to the prostitution or not necessary consequences of it, the worst of these crimes undeniably are. When I said earlier, won't somebody please think of the children, it wasn't just about the kids trying to go to school. It was also about the actual girls, not women, but girls being trafficked in these operations. Looking the other way on prostitution means there's a market for import and industrial operations are moving in to satisfy it. Local investigators and the FBI say girls often only 15 or 16 years old are brought in from out of city and out of state. Young girls walking in the middle of the street, hanging around the sidewalks, peeking into cars. Gallo says the women are getting younger. I've seen them as young as 15, 16. Gallo says many of the women were brought into the city specifically to East 15th Street. In the evenings, you'll see a van come up and unload the girls, and these are vans that are not from Oakland. Notably, the California age of consent is 18. So even if you want to dismiss the likely kidnapping, we still have a major problem here. And according to the FBI's local investigator, the problem is even worse than that. Sources confirmed to the I-team the FBI picked up a 13-year-old girl along East 15th Street in Oakland just last week. Now, of course, as I often discuss, I have my skepticism about any FBI claim these days, but it's hard to deny when the pimps are driving actual windowless pedo vans. Gallo says the vans typically have out-of-state license plates. They arrive early in the morning and leave around 8 in the evening. So, the question is, to what degree are the original policy and these secondary effects linked? It seems, all but inarguable, they are. Almost inseparably, if not entirely so, the relaxed attitude toward the minor crime is providing the incentives and the avenues to facilitate the more serious ones. On principle, I do not like the idea of punishing one thing because it could lead to another, but upon review, that's certainly better than seeing the other thing fully realized. It's bad enough seeing it through the comfortable detachment of my computer screen 1,200 miles away. I'm sure I'd be even more strongly persuaded if my kids walked to school, included an unsolicited obese nipple exhibit. In a strange way, that is the beauty of a federalist system. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's beauty in the slutty outfits, certainly not in the horrendous trafficking and other crimes. I am saying there is value in a system that allows states to experiment with their own policies and the rest of us to just sit back and watch. It allows the rest of us to see the consequences of certain decisions without testing it ourselves. I don't have to contemplate abstractly about what the principles of relaxed prostitution policy are, I can just watch this play out and challenge myself to analyze whether I'm thinking about this issue or any other correctly. In this case, it is a very useful demonstration of the risk that my philosophical inclinations entail. It is a mechanism to force me to think critically if so-called victimless crime is the proper way to characterize these things. So of course, I will do that. Scenes like this offer no other choice. In this case, California, I'm not actually pointing and laughing at you, maybe just a little bit, but at least not primarily. I am watching closely and taking notes. In many contexts, we only get debate about what might happen if we try certain things. In this context and others, California steps right up and demonstrates. I wouldn't say that's worthy of admiration, of course, but it is certainly worthy of attention. Maybe even a bag of chips, too. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Parlor. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.